after his resurrection, Jesus gathers his disciples together and he gives them a commandment. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we see it at the beginning of the book of Acts, we see it. It's called the Great Commission, where Jesus gathers the apostles together, gathers this group of disciples together, and tells them, go and make disciples in the whole world. Now, you have probably heard that before. You have heard the term Great Commission, or you've heard that command that, yes, Christians and the church are to go out into the world and make disciples share the good news of Jesus with more and more people so that they receive His grace, they receive His forgiveness, receive life and salvation in His name. And we've heard it so many times that we can think, well, okay, yeah, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. But for the original audience... For the people that heard that command for the first time, imagine how daunting that is. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, we're told that it's just the 11. It's just the 11 original apostles hearing this command from Jesus and being told, you 11 go out into the whole world and make disciples of everybody. So now when we start thinking about it, like, wow, there's just 11 of us that's a lot harder to pull off. It's a lot harder to imagine and picture us actually being able to do. It's an intimidating thing. Now, what does this have to do with All Saints Day, All Saints Sunday? Well, All Saints Sunday is this day where we look back throughout history at God's faithfulness to His people and keeping His promises but also we look at the faithfulness of the saints that have gone before us and their boldness and their courage and their willingness to follow Jesus no matter where He leads them, no matter what He calls them to do. Even if it is something as grand and bold and courageous as telling the 11 apostles, go into the whole world and make disciples of all nations. Even when it sounds as something like as impossible as that. How do you expect 11 people to go into the whole world and make disciples of all nations? But we need to remember these things. We need to be told about these things and, and see these pictures of God's faithfulness, but also the boldness of the saints that have gone before us because the same command is still in place for us. The Great Commission wasn't just for the 11 apostles, but it was for the whole church. Yes, it started with them, but then it grew and went out to all Christians in all places. And it's still a command that we are called to do, and it's still one that has a dire need. Because currently there are estimated to be 2 billion people on the planet who have never even heard the name of Jesus. Not that there are two billion people on the planet that don't believe in Jesus, don't like Jesus, but haven't even heard of who Jesus is. And now there's more Christians, there's more of us than just the 11 apostles. But we hear to Billy, we hear such an urgent spiritual need in our world, we think, wow, it still sounds almost impossible. So where do we get the courage? Where do we get the faith to be obedient to the Great Commission and say whatever it takes, whatever we have to do to make sure that people hear about the name of Jesus, hear about the grace and the salvation, the forgiveness and the life that is found in Jesus. Well, we get it by looking to the past and seeing the courage and the boldness of the saints of the past, but also by looking at the faithfulness of God throughout history. And this is what All Saints Day is about. Yes, it's about remembering and giving thanks to God for the people that have gone before us. But it's also about finding boldness and courage in our own hearts and our own faith to keep doing the mission, to keep following and obeying the Great Commission, just like all the saints that have gone before us did. 
And see, we are the receivers of that blessing. We are the receiving end of that faithfulness of the saints that have gone before us. We have a responsibility to the people that will come after us. And so I want to look at a story in 1 Samuel chapter 14. It's a wonderful story of courage and faith and obedience, but it's also a beautiful story of God's faithfulness to his people. And All Saints Day is this combination of where we look to God's faithfulness throughout history, and we also find inspiration and courage and boldness in our faith by looking at the faith of the saints that have gone before us so that working together, we can keep working at the Great Commission. We can keep working at sharing the faith and passing the faith on to future generations. So, first. Samuel chapter 14 is the story of a man named Jonathan and his armor bearer. Jonathan is the prince of Israel. He is the oldest son of the king of Israel, King Saul. And they are at war, and they're having many battles with the nation of Philistia. So they're fighting these people called the Philistines. And Israel is not doing so great. They don't have an amazing army They don't have a huge nation, and so they actually are losing battle after battle. And Jonathan has this bold plan, this daring idea, and he believes that God will give his people victory. And so we see this story in 1 Samuel chapter 14. That same day, Saul's son Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on, let's cross over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. However, he did not tell his father. Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod, was also there. He was the son of Ahitub, the brother of Ichabod, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest of Shiloh. But the troops did not know that Jonathan had left. So I know it's a bunch of names, but here's what's happening is that Jonathan wakes up in the middle of the night and he grabs his armor bearer. He doesn't tell his father, the king, the leader of the military. He doesn't tell the high priest. And he doesn't tell any of the other soldiers or troops. And so he's sneaking off on his own with only his armor bearer. Because Jonathan has this daring, bold plan that God will give him and his people victory over their enemies. And again, Jonathan doesn't have a lot going for him. His people have been losing battle after battle. He doesn't take anybody but his armor bearer with him, so he's going to be outnumbered. And in 1 Samuel chapter 13, the previous chapter, what we see is that there is no blacksmith in the entire land of Israel because the Philistines had outlawed it because they didn't want a rebellion. And so essentially what we're told in the previous chapter is that in the entire land of Israel, there's no one to make weapons. And in the entire land, in the entire military of Israel, there's essentially two swords, two weapons of war, Saul, the king, has one, and Jonathan, his son, has the other. So they are extremely outmatched. It's an overwhelming and intimidating and almost impossible task to achieve victory over the Philistines. And these are the circumstances that Jonathan wakes up to and says, let us go over, let's go find them, rather than just waiting here. And so we continue the story. There were sharp columns of rock on both sides of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine garrison. And Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. There's two major reasons why I love this story. The first is this statement of faith 
from Jonathan where he says, Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, by, whether by many or by few. See, Jonathan knows we, we don't have the many. We don't have any weapons. We're outnumbered. We don't have a great army. But we have a great God. And how inspiring and encouraging this is for us as God's people. Because this statement is still true for us to this day. That nothing can stop God from saving. Nothing can stop God from saving you, from saving your loved ones, from saving them, from providing forgiveness between two people that are in conflict with another, providing healing, from providing reconciliation. There is nothing that can stop our God from saving. And I love this passage in the context of the Great Commission. That when we look out in the world, it feels like there's all kinds of sin and brokenness and division and wickedness going throughout the world. And it can feel overwhelming. It can feel like a daunting, impossible task to just go out into the world and make disciples of all nations when there's two billion people who haven't even heard about Jesus. We can start to think to ourselves, well, what difference can I make? There's just one of me, or there's just a, a few of us. What chance do we have? And see, that was the attitude of many of the people in Israel at the time. What chance do we have against the Philistines? And Jonathan's attitude is, well, I don't have much of a chance, but my God does. Because there's a lot that can stop me. There's a lot that can overwhelm me. But there's nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Because the saving comes from God. The, the life change comes from God. Not by our great numbers, not by our great ingenuity, not by our great ideas, but by God doing the work, by God keeping His promises to save and redeem His people. So I love the boldness of Jonathan. That as we think about our participation in the Great Commission. Now, obviously, Jonathan was fighting the Philistines, and we're told throughout the New Testament that our battle is not with flesh and blood, meaning it's not with people. But as Paul says in Ephesians, that it's against the principalities and, and the rulers and the princes of this world, meaning Satan, a demon. That's, we're at a spiritual level fighting against wickedness and sin and evil in the world. And the same thing is still true for us that was true for Jonathan, that there's nothing that can stop our God from saving, whether with a lot or with just a little. And so Jonathan says this great statement of faith, but there's another person in this story. It's his armor bearer. And in verse 7 it says, His armor bearer responded, Do what is in your heart. Go ahead. I am completely with you. My favorite translation of this verse says, I am with you heart and soul. So this is the second reason I love this story, is that Jonathan doesn't go alone. Yes, he has this courageous faith that says, my God can do anything. And I love that Jonathan even says, perhaps God will. He doesn't know for sure that he will be successful, but he is for sure in his God's faithfulness to him. See, Jonathan isn't sure that his plan will work. Jonathan doesn't know if he will have victory. But Jonathan knows that his God has the power to save, that his God has the power to do the work. But his armor bearer also gives a great statement of faith and courage. He says, you do everything that is in your heart. I'm complete with you. I am with you heart and soul. See, the world needs Jonathan's and the world needs armor bearers. 
that come alongside each other and work together and in faithfulness to God say, well, we're in this together. Okay, this is a crazy plan. This is a, this is a crazy idea that we're going to go to the whole world and, and tell everybody about Jesus. But I'm with you, heart and soul. It's a crazy idea. We're going to forgive others. We're going to forgive them. But I'm with you, heart and soul. It's a, it's a crazy idea. That we're going to be generous and serve even when it causes us to sacrifice and hurt a little. But I'm with you, heart and soul. See, when we remember the saints, it's not just remembering the people that are named like Jonathan. It's not just remembering the people that, that got all of the stories in the Bible and that we can remember and tell stories about. But it's also about the people that are unnamed, like the armor bearer who had courage just like Jonathan said, I am with you, heart and soul. So we need Jonathan's and we need armor bearers. We need people to go out into the world to forgive, to serve, to love, to help, to share the gospel of Jesus so that we can make disciples of all nations. We need people with the boldness of Jonathan that says, well, there might only be a few of us. We might not have a lot of money. We might not have a lot of technology. We might not have a lot of gifts and talents, but we have our God. Essentially what Jonathan is saying is, our God is enough to do the work He has given us. Our God is enough to save. Our God is enough to change lives. And we also need people like the armor bearer that come along and say, I am with you all the way. I am with you heart and soul in this mission and in this work. I will be there with you every step of the way. I love this story because of the boldness and the courage of Jonathan. But I also love this story because of the boldness and the courage of the armor bearer. And I love this reminder that when we celebrate and remember all the saints, that some of them, we know their names. And others we just call the armor bearer. But all of them are needed to remind us of what bold, courageous faith looks like but to also remind us that our God is strong enough and mighty enough to save. That even when we feel overwhelmed and we feel outmatched and outnumbered, we feel completely exhausted and worn out, we can say, but our, nothing can stop our God from saving, whether with many or just a few. Now the story goes on and God is faithful to Jonathan and the armor bearer. God is faithful to his people and gives them victory. He gives them salvation. And this is the other important part of All Saints Day is that it's remembering God's faithfulness throughout history. And so I want to look at a story out of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11, is this incredibly famous passage and this famous scripture that lists off all of these heroes of the faith, all these saints that have gone before us. And it shows that they were faithful to God, but just as importantly and probably more importantly, God was faithful to them. And so Hebrews chapter 11 lists off all of these people that were faithful to God and that throughout history from the Old Testament to the new, that God provided faithfulness and kept His promises to them over and over again. And at the end of this wonderful list and teaching on the faithfulness of God throughout history, we see this sentence which you are probably familiar with. It says, Therefore, 
since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. See, we, we know this passage is a very famous verse that reminds us that, hey, we are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. But there's something fascinating about it, right? We can't just read it out of context. The context is Hebrews chapter 11, where the author of Hebrews lists off all of these saints that have gone before the New Testament, that have all gone before the saints that he is writing to. And he's saying, we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. But the cloud of witnesses that they're surrounded by are not the people in front of them. It's the people that have gone before them. And so what the author of Hebrews is doing is reminding them that you and I, as members of the church, are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. And why does that matter? Why is that so important? Because he wants to remind us, to remind you and me, that we're not alone in running this race. That we're not alone in following Jesus and fulfilling the Great Commission. The New Testament church was under pressure and persecution during the time that Hebrews was written. And they were feeling isolated and overwhelmed. They were feeling beat up and worn out. And he is reminding them, but you're not alone. There's this cloud of witnesses with you and before you and surrounding you. That all the saints that have gone before us are these witnesses to who our God is, to His faithfulness, to His people. See, one of the important parts of remembering All Saints Day and looking to the past is to be comforted and encouraged in our faith that reminds us we are not alone. To remind us that our God is faithful from generation to generation. And I love how he ends it by saying, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. See, the power of remembering the saints that have gone before us is remembering the promises of God and His faithfulness throughout each generation. But it's also remembering the God that the saints point us to. See, when Jonathan has this great moment of courage and boldness, and he says, hey, the odds are stacked against us. We are outnumbered. We have zero chance on paper of winning. But our God is with us. See, Jonathan's courage and boldness doesn't come from within himself. He's just like, well, I'm Jonathan and I have a sword. We can do this. His courage and his boldness comes from his belief in who his God is. That his God is able to save whether with many or with few. And so we remember not just the great things that the saints did before us, as Hebrews 11 shows us with Abraham and Moses and all the other heroes of the faith, but we remember, most importantly, the God that they point us to. Whether they are named or unnamed. That because of their faithfulness, because of their courage and their boldness, more and more people heard about Jesus. Because of their boldness and because of their courage and because of their faithfulness, more and more people throughout every single generation have come to faith in Jesus because they ran the race 
that was before them. And they did it not because they're better than you, not because they're more awesome than us, but because they kept their eyes on Jesus. Now, I love this story of Jonathan, and I love his courage and his faithfulness. I love that God in the moment provides them with victory. But if you read the stories of the saints that have gone before us, it doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't always lead to an immediate victory. And this is actually the point that the author of Hebrews is trying to make. That yes, God did miraculous things throughout history and throughout each generation. And yes, people were faithful to God and sometimes they were given victory. But sometimes they weren't. At least not as Hebrews teaches us in this life here and now. And Hebrews teaches us they were striving after a different kind of victory, a eternal victory. Now, why is this so important? Why is this so encouraging? Because sometimes we are going to be bold and courageous. And we're going to go out. And we're going to be obedient to God. We're going to serve. We're going to help. We're going to love. We're going to give. We're going to forgive. We're going to seek reconciliation. We're going to share the gospel. And it will hurt. And it will cost us. And it will beat us up. And sometimes we're going to be bold in our faith. We're going to go out. We're going to do all those same things. And we're going to see miracles happen. We're going to see lives change. We're going to see God at work here in the moment. And what Scripture teaches us and the importance of all saints of looking back is that both are good. Both are faithful. In fact, this is what Hebrews 11 teaches us. Others experienced mockings and scourgings as well as chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. And the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the grounds. All these were approved through their faith. So here's a powerful teaching at the end of this chapter. After listing all the famous people, all the people that we read about throughout the Old Testament, throughout history, that teach us, wow, look how bold and faithful they were. Look what God miraculously did in their lives. And I love that the author of Hebrews includes this section too. That reminds us that there are other people who are just as faithful, just as bold, and just as courageous in sharing their faith and passing on the faith of God to the next generation. And the result for them was to experience mockings and scourging, chains and imprisonment, being sown and sawed into, and all kinds of other sacrifices and sufferings and persecutions. Now here's the point with that. When we look back at the saints that have come before us, we don't just receive boldness and courage in our faith because the miracles happened. We see boldness and courage in our faith because sometimes the miracles didn't happen and they were still faithful through it all. They still showed us that God is worth it, that following Jesus is worth it, even when there is pain, even when there is hurt, even when there is suffering and persecution. So the courage comes to us, not because we see grand stories of miracles happening, but because we see the stories of everyday people who are faithful and obedient to God, no matter the cost, 
and to whom God was faithful as well by giving them eternal life. One of my favorite stories is a man named Polycarp, and he is a saint in the history of the church, and he was a student of the Apostle John. And Polycarp was incredibly faithful to Jesus. He was incredibly faithful in sharing the gospel and spreading the good news of Jesus throughout his lifetime. And eventually, Polycarp, just like the rest of the early church, came under heavy persecution and threats of violence against his life. And eventually, he was found by the governing authorities. And he was imprisoned and he was brought before the governor. And Polycarp was given the opportunity to take it all back. And historically, the governor told Polycarp, you will save your life and you will go free if you simply renounce Jesus and never speak of him again. But if you don't, and if you continue to believe in Jesus, and if you continue to speak about Jesus, we will burn you at the stake as an example to others. And Polycarp's response as they were tying him up to the pile of wood that was going to kill him was this, 86 years have I served him and he has never done me injury. How then can I now blaspheme my king and savior? So he wouldn't give Jesus up because he knew that Jesus is worth it even in death because Jesus gives resurrection and eternal life. And after saying this, they ended up executing Polycarp as an example. And the governor was right. Polycarp became an example to others, but not in the way he intended. He became an example of what it looks like to be obedient and faithful to Jesus, even if it means suffering, even if it means sacrifice, even if it means persecution, even if it means death. See, as we look back at God's faithfulness throughout the generations, as we look and see the faithfulness and obedience of the saints that have gone before us, we see stories of God rescuing people out of danger. We see God rescuing people out of the mouths of lions. We also see people being faithful unto death and being devoured by lions. We see people being rescued from a fiery furnace. And we see people like Polycarp who are faithful even unto death, even though they were not rescued from the fire. See, the importance of All Saints Day, the encouragement for you and I is to see the faithfulness of God throughout all generations, but to also see the boldness and the courage and the faithfulness of the saints that have gone before us. The saints that said, it is worth it to follow God, to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. It is worth it to share the gospel so that future generations will know His love, His grace, His forgiveness, so that future generations will receive life and salvation in His name, no matter what it costs us here and now. So I love All Saints Sunday because it reminds us of the beauty of the church that God is faithful to His people throughout all generations. That Jesus is worth it here and now and for all eternity. And it's also this beautiful reminder that you and I are not alone. That as we are following Jesus, as we are obeying the Great Commission, is that we are saying the cost is worth it to share Jesus with others. 
we are reminded that we are not alone, that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so as we remember the past, we are given courage for the present here and now. And we are given boldness to count the cost and say, it is worth it to pass Jesus on to the future. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your faithfulness to your people throughout history. That you save your people, whether by many or by few. That you work for our good. We thank you for the saints that have gone before us. We thank you for their witness. We thank you for their boldness. And most importantly, we thank you for their courage to share the faith and to pass it on to the next generation. Help us to be a people that are encouraged and emboldened by their faithful witness so that we will be able to pass on the faith to others and to the next generation. In your name we pray. Amen.